Hey, we're starting this series. It's called When You Pray. And it's a good series. It's a timely series because it's always time to pray. It's, it's, it's an interesting topic to, to, uh, to broach because prayer seems like such a deceivingly simple thing to talk about. I mean, what, what is prayer? Uh, I think probably a lot of people who attended Sunday school would say prayer is talking to God, right? You remember? Okay, so that's not going to go very far in a message. And yet, I think we can say that prayer is actually much more complicated. There's a whole lot uh, more uh, sides to this thing than just prayer is talking to God. But that's a great place to start. Maybe one of the questions that we would ask when talking about prayer is what makes a good prayer? What constitutes a good prayer? And, of course, uh, we, as parents, uh, how many parents in the house here today? Okay. So as parents, one of the things that we try to do is we help our kids with that. We teach them prayers. For example, you know, we might evaluate some of the prayers that we taught our kids. One would be, you know, a really comforting prayer when it's time for them to go to sleep. Uh, you know, should prayers rhyme, for example? And this one does, if that's a good quality for a prayer. Uh, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Uh, sounds good so far, very rhymy, if that's a good quality for a prayer. Uh, if I should die before I wake, and we might want to stop there for a moment because uh, that line we might want to evaluate. I, I, I'm, it's theologically sound, if I should die uh, before I wake, uh, I pray the Lord my soul to take. But as a parent, uh, generally as a rule, I mean just generally, I try to avoid... Uh, the topic that someone or something may come and kill my children in their sleep right before they go to bed. Um, I mean, I, I, it, whatever. I, if, if, that's, if that's a really popular prayer in your household, by all means. Uh, I, I tend to avoid that prayer personally. It just is, it's, it's, it creates questions uh, like, should I go to sleep ever? Um, and so it's hard enough to get kids to go to sleep. So uh, I, I tend to avoid that. Maybe you like it, though, and that's all right. Um, you sh- is, what makes a good prayer? Uh, you know, if you ask that prayer, you'd be in good company because the disciples actually asked that same question. What makes a good prayer? Uh, they said it to Jesus in Luke chapter 11. They said Jesus teaches to pray. It was right after he had just finished praying this powerful prayer, and they said they were amazed by the prayer. Have you ever been in a, in, in a room with someone or in an environment with someone and they prayed and you were just like, whoa, dude, that really hit home. Like, and, and, and so that's what happened with the disciples. They were like, okay, that was a prayer, Jesus. Like, wow. And they said, oh, someone's calling me. Interesting. Oh, okay. I'm gonna, you know what I'm going to do? This is an excellent time for this. Um, I am going to mute my phone. I, I don't know. Maybe that was, on, that was a good thing. Also, oh, there's my clock. That'll help me keep on time. Okay, so um, what, back where was I? Oh, so they said Jesus teach us to pray. And, uh, and so he said, okay, deal. Uh, I'll do that. And, he, and so then he does. He begins this, this brief uh, lecture on prayer. Uh, but he does it by giving a prayer example. He does the exact same thing, by the way, in Matthew chapter 6, which is where we're going to hone in on. So if you want to open up your scripture today, it'll be on the screen as well. But Matthew chapter 6, the, this, this paragraph, if you will, this prayer has become known as the Lord's Prayer. And depending on your background, maybe the Our Father. And so it's a very familiar prayer. We're going to pray. We're going to do something actually that we don't normally do in this environment. Uh, some other churches, liturgical environment, they do it every Sunday. But we're going to do it today. We're going to all read the prayer together. We're going to read it from the actual King James Version. I think I'm going to have it up on the screen. But let's pray this prayer or read it together. You ready? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Is that a familiar prayer? You heard that before? 
probably here in this room, you've probably heard that prayer or prayed it several times. If you're listening online, if you're live streaming, by the way, welcome. We're glad that you're with us this morning. Chances are you have prayed this prayer enough or heard it enough that it's actually memorized. And I w not necessarily a show of hands, but it's, it's probably one of those that is completely memorized. If you're Catholic or if you grew up Catholic, this was a prayer that you probably prayed five times a day, right? So this is familiar territory. And yet there is a danger. Um, I would say the, 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 with the exception of the Catholics, that last line was the line that, that you probably didn't pray because that's, that doesn't appear in all manuscripts. That's another uh, confusing topic that we don't have time for. But well, let's just say that there's a danger in this uh, topic today because it's familiar territory. Have you ever heard this uh, statement, familiarity uh, breeds contempt? You heard that before? Okay, so <clears throat> the danger here is that it's because it's so familiar, it's easy for our brains and our hearts to just disengage. Disengage when we say these words and disengage when someone speaks about this topic because we've heard it before. So I want to do this. Uh, w the danger especially is in the light of this context, which is what we're going to look at in just a moment. But I want to pray. Father, I pray right now that your spirit would come and would break through our tendency to disengage from these familiar words. God, break through the sense that you're absent. And God, that we would sense your presence right here, right now. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> okay. So the context of this passage, the large context of this passage in Matthew 6, is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is on a, a, a mountainside gathering, and he delivers this amazing sermon. And it covers a broader range uh, of topics, but the theme is this. He talks about the kingdom of heaven, what it's like, which he spent his entire ministry talking about, by the way. And he talks about how the kingdom of heaven is different from the kingdom of this world. And I don't have time to, to, to go there, but there was a great message that we had back on our series on 14 final days of Jesus. And we talked about the kingdom of heaven. And that would be a, a complimentary series to, to today's message. So if you want to go in and listen to that later on, uh, tune in. I, I think it's a powerful message. But it talks about how the kingdom of this world uh, is so different from the kingdom of God. And Jesus came as a representative of the kingdom of heaven to say, listen, this is how we do it. This is the kingdom of heaven. Here's what it's like, and you want to be a part because it's an eternal kingdom. There's an eternal king with an eternal kingdom, and only his subjects will live in his kingdom. That was the, the main point of that sermon. So he, he says, this is how it's different. And then he says, and this is how it's different from the religious leaders of today, the scribes and the Pharisees, who Jesus called hypocrites. Does that sound familiar? So he spent his time contrasting how the religious people were doing things and how we should do things as kingdom uh, citizens. And then our immediate context for this verse is we can look at in Matthew 6, verse 5. So I want us to go there right now. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. I'm going to look at it in the ESV uh, translation. It says, and when you pray, again, this is Jesus talking, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door when you pray. Do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard by their many words. Don't be like them, or do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. So my first point today, and these points are going to be extremely practical and extremely simple, but I, I'd love for you to write them down and refer back to later. The first point is this. When you pray, now Jesus didn't say if you pray, right? He said when, okay? So my first point is this. When you pray, pray. When you pray, pray. I'll tell you, I think that we can't over-preach or over-teach the need to pray. Do you pray? Are you a person of prayer? When you pray, pray. Think about this. 
When you're before God, it is the only time and the only person that you're standing before that you could never deceive or lie to. When you pray, pray. Don't pretend. Because you can't deceive him. And the context here with Jesus is he says, don't be like the hypocrites. Now let's dissect the word hypocrite for a moment. The hypocrite, uh, you, before Jesus used it to really rebuke the Pharisees, wasn't a negative word. It was just a word describing a person uh, or a occupation. And the occupation was actor. These were the hypocrites, the people whose job it was to act for an audience. And like any actor, we love that they love what they do. And we applaud them. And I love actors. I mean, I love a good actor. I love a good movie. And I, and I, don't, I don't hate the fact that they're acting. I love that they're acting and they're good at their craft. And so I applaud them. And, and hypocrites would have done the same thing. They would have been applauded by men. But Jesus says, don't be like that when it's time for prayer. As a matter of fact, don't be like that in your spiritual life ever. Because, because the irony is you can't be that way in front of God. You can't. He's the one person that you can never deceive or lie to. And when you try to do that, you're only lying to yourself. So he says, hey, don't be like the hypocrites, right? Don't pretend. Pray. Prayer is more than thinking. It's more than talking. Prayer is more than, than wishful thinking. It's a conversation. We know that, right? It's a conversation, but it's a conversation that's born out of relationship. It's purpose. Prayer's purpose is singular. There's only one purpose of prayer because there's only one audience, and it's our Father. It's a, that's who we pray to. That's the extent of our prayer. That's it. Jesus says, don't be like the Pharisees. His prayers are empty. They're not going anywhere. Here's a challenge. I have a challenge for you today. Challenge for everyone in the room. Challenge for those of you listening on, on podcasts. If you want to grow, do you want to grow spiritually? This next uh, phrase may catch you off guard, but here's my challenge. My challenge is this. Stop saying prayers. If you want to grow spiritually, stop saying prayers. The Pharisees were good at saying prayers. And the prophets of old would have condemned them because they would have said, you're drawing near to me with your lips, but your heart, where's your heart? Your heart is far from me. And Jesus said, don't be like the Pharisees. When you draw near, here's what he would have said. The Pharisees come when there's a crowd. And Jesus would have said, you, hey, you, guys, you want to know how to pray? I'll tell you. But before I teach you how to pray, I want to teach you how to approach God. If you want to pray, here's what you do. You push past the crowd. Forget about them. And you go and you seek God. And here's how you do it. You do it alone. And you do it quietly, and you seek him. And he said, the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes, they have the reward. What was their reward? Their prayers went no further than the sound of their own voice. And their prayers didn't reach God. Why? Why didn't their prayers reach God? Because their prayers weren't intended for God. Their prayers reached their audience. It was everyone around them. It was themselves to make themselves feel good. Um, Jesus actually talked about this in another passage, and you can see it in Luke chapter 20, verse 46 and 47. He said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love respectful greetings in the marketplaces and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets who devour widows' houses and for appearance's sake offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. So what was Jesus saying here? He's saying, listen, if you want, again, if you want to, step one, if you want to, to talk about praying or learning to pray, step one is how you approach God. 
Our prayer life, you might write this down, our prayer life is affected by how we approach God. It makes sense, doesn't it? Jesus said how we approach him matters. Don't be like the hypocrites. But also, you know, Jesus said if you want to meet with God, go quietly. But listen, go alone. Go secretly. But it wasn't about the secrecy. Understand, Jesus wasn't prescribing that this is how true holy prayers are done is in quiet moments. As a matter of fact, he told a parable that actually contradicts that, if that's your thought. And you can go there in Luke chapter 18. You still with me? Luke chapter 18 and verse 9 through 14. He, uh, Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee, and the other, a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, look at it, see that the word himself. You might have another translation that, that says, the Pharisee prayed thus to himself. That's telling. It's telling, right? He prayed to himself. But it also says he was standing by himself in this translation. So it kind of depends on how you look at it. So I think there's a twofold translation there. But I'm going to get to that in a moment. The prayer Pharisee in ESV says, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. <laughs> this guy, what a cocky prayer. I mean, he just points out a guy right in the middle of his prayer. You immediately don't like this guy, right? And that was the point of Jesus telling the story. He's like, I know you're not going to like this guy when I tell it, okay? Um, so he says, I, I think that I'm not even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. And before I read this, here we we see the heart of the, the Pharisee, right? The, that's who we presume is the person that Jesus is describing here. This religious person. Oh, he does call him a Pharisee. That's right. So the Pharisee was standing by himself. We see his heart. He's praying all. He does seem to give a little bit of a gratitude, but who is he really grateful to? Himself. I'm grateful to me. Uh, good job, me. And that's his prayer, Right? And Jesus says, listen, that doesn't go far before the kingdom of heaven. And then he says, but there was a man. And we, the, the prayer is so simple that we might just slip right past it. This is all he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. But look at the context. He says, standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. And this is telling but he beat his breast. This prayer is about to get real. If somebody is doing this somewhere, what's about ready to come out is volatile. It's vocal. It's emotional. It's gut-wrenching. It's visceral. And it's real. That's why Jesus pointed him out and said, if you want to, you know, who, you know who the father hears is this guy. Can you, can you just picture that? I mean, in my prayer time, as I was preparing for this, man, it just broke me because I, I just picture him kneeling. He says he's by himself. He, he, he can't go f too close to God, he feels. But he, so he's just kneeling afar off he won't even lift up his eyes so so he's just pounding his chest and he says god why do you why do you hit yourself right why do you do this cuz you don't like you right god Have mercy on me, a sinner. Do 
to hear the heart in that prayer because God hears it and he loves it. He loves that prayer. And he loves it because he hears the heart there and he runs to you. You know, God isn't reluctant to come to you when you pray to him. God's not reluctant to answer your prayer and he's never far away from a contrite heart. If you're listening today, you're here in the room today, I'll tell you, the Father is just one step away from that prayer. And he was here with this guy. So the question here is, should prayers be quiet? Is that what Jesus is teaching us? Well, here's what I, I think. I think in that context, I don't think that tax collector's ter- prayers were quiet. Do you? I think they were vocal, and I think that people heard it. But his audience was one. And so why did Jesus then go to the trouble of even addressing the need to go privately in prayer? I think it's, I think it's because Jesus in his teaching was intensely practical. And he saw the need that if we're going to talk about prayer, we know we need to talk about approaching God. And he saw the need was this, intimacy with God. And he saw that if, if, if he was going to talk about praying to God, that the first thing that needed to be handled was that people needed to get to know his dad. Listen, if you want to know how to pray, first thing you want to do is get to know my father. You want to pray? When you pray, pray. And here's how you do it. Get to know my dad. Start there. Get to know my father. You with me today? So step one is you build intimacy. I love that I have a personal relationship with each one of my sons. I try to do that. I try to be intentional. But I take them out every once in a while, and I I, I need to do this again. Uh, I take them out on daddy dates. Is that corny? But... But we go get breakfast together. We go hang out together. We do stuff just me and one son at a time. Because it's important that they have a relationship with me apart from their brothers. Because I want them to know that I love them. Not just that I love our family as a group. And it's the same thing, I think, in our personal relationship with God. It's so awesome that we're here together, we're gathered together, but we have a relationship with our Father that's intimate. And it must be that way. You know, if you want your prayer life to be powerful, you build intimacy with God. So back to Jesus' message uh, here. When you pray, pray. And the next point is, when you pray, pray to God. So, in the first part, we talked about, hey, don't be like the hypocrites because they use all these words. The King James said, vain repetition. You know, in, I don't want to knock any religious group, but if your habit of prayer is saying the same things over and over and over and over again, it's exactly what Jesus condemned in that passage. It's what Jesus said not to do. So when you pray, that's why I say when you pray, pray. Be real. Talk to God. Have some time with God. Share with him. And then, uh, that's why I say, when you pray, pray to God. Remember who you're praying to. So pray, and then pray to God. Jesus lays down this pattern. It's, it's a pattern for us. Remember, he isn't giving us a prescribed poem that we recite. It's not an incantation. It's a pattern that if we follow in our prayer times will draw us closer to God. So the danger here is some of us weren't taught to pray. Many of us weren't taught to pray. Somebody didn't sit down and and do this and say, here's how you pray. So Jesus went to the trouble of doing it for us. The danger is if we believe that prayer is this, I close my eyes and I ask for stuff. That's what most of us do when we pray. Close our eyes and we ask for stuff. And then we say, in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, that's that's what many of us do just on a default. Even those of us who've heard this prayer and even thought about a prayer pattern before, on a default, we close our eyes and we ask for stuff because our attention is on who. Even in our prayer, 
even if we're praying morning and night, our attention is on who? It's on us. And so what Jesus does is he flips it, and the first thing he does is he puts the attention on God. But it makes sense, right? You're praying to God. You should put your attention there. So let's look at it just line by line. There's, if, we, if we break the prayer down, and you can do more than what I'm doing this morning. I pray, ask the Lord. Did you know it's a great idea to, because we, we want to grow close to God, one of the things that people say is you read the word. Go to church, worship, in song, read the word. But did you know you'll get so much more out of all of those things if you begin and end with prayer? Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Oh, just that part alone. And now I ask, your will be done in my life. Speak to me according to the pages of these word, the, the word here as I open it up. Speak to me and your will be done. I, 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 I bow the knee. And if there's areas in my life that, that aren't right, I'm going to get them right because your will be done. My sword is yours. My heart is yours. That's the prayer. And you do that before you read. And you do that before you worship. And there is a new depth of intimacy that happens when you do those things. So that's why Jesus gave us this pattern. Who is in heaven? Our Father who is in heaven. What does that speak to me? Here's what I did. I think Louis might have some, some of my notes up on the screen. To me, I thought this pattern reminds me, one, who God is. And it reminds me, who, two, who my relation, what my relationship is like. As a result of who he is, my relationship to him. And the third thing is, what does my heart impact as a result of that truth? So who is in heaven? It reminds me that he is the creator, and I'm the creature. He is God, and I'm not. And my heart impact is it's incredibly humbling when I remember that. And I am not the center even of my own world. He is. Secondly, hallowed be your name. Reminds me that he is the deity, he's the God, and I am the worshiper. I worship him, and my desire then, the heart impact of that, is that my, my desire in everything I do, all of, all of my, my plans and my, the things that I set in motion and the things I decide to do or not do, all of them come under the criteria of, is this honoring to my God? Does this honor God? And so as I pray, as I, as, as I bring needs and requests before the Lord, I pray. So that's why when I pray, I don't just ask for healing. When I pray, I say, Lord, I ask for healing to glorify your name. Let this bring a praise about to your name. Because otherwise, don't heal. Let it be. A, that's real, right? It's about you and you only. And if it's about me, you know, it, it doesn't matter. You. Your kingdom come. That's the next line. Your kingdom come. Why? Because my kingdom is different. The kingdom of this world is already here, and it is destruction. It's, it's misery. The kingdom of this world is in contrast to the kingdom that God has come to bring. So the relationship there is that he is sovereign, that he's the ruler, he's the king, and I am his subject. Again, that message in that I referred to earlier, there's an eternal king with an eternal kingdom, and only his subjects will dwell in his kingdom. I don't have rights. In the kingdom of heaven, I don't have rights apart from Jesus. My rights, Paul said it this way, he said, we are living sacrifices. What? What right does a living sacrifice have? Right? Think, do you think about that way? Those are my rights. And so I willingly lay everything down at the feet of my king. And what it does is it renews my commitment to him. I always think of it in terms of knighthood, but I just lay my sword down and I say, My sword is yours. I am yours. Do with me what you will. Spend me for your kingdom's sake. Colossians. 1, verse 12, is a powerful passage. Talks about, I think fleshes this out a little bit, but it says, giving thanks, this is verse 12, giving thanks to the Father. Everybody say Father. 
who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. That's the context. As we pray this prayer, we remembered that I once was under the domain of darkness. But praise be to God, I'm a child of light, and I belong to a different kingdom because of what God has done, because of his mercy and because of his grace. Oh, aren't you glad for the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ applied to your heart in life today? And then he says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It just reminds me again that he's the master and I'm his servant. I bow the knee. So Jesus taught us this pattern. I'll just stop right there for a moment. That much right there, if you apply that much to your life, it will change and draw you, change your prayer life, affect it and draw you closer to God than ever. Jesus taught us this pattern, again, because our prayer is affected by how we approach God. Have you ever opened your mouth, began to pray, and then stopped and considered this? I'm about to approach the one being who dwells in unapproachable light. 1 Timothy 6.16 says that he dwells in inapproachable light whom no one has ever seen nor can see. We're about to approach that one. I'm about to open through this door of prayer and he is going to be on the other side. And then, in context with that, we go back to, we kind of blew past the most powerful part of the prayer, which is the first two words. Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this, our Father. Whew. The word he uses there was unlike any other word that any spiritual leader had ever used before to refer to God. Not that they didn't use the word Father, but he, they used the word Father in the context of Father of all things, Father who created everything. But here he doesn't use that word. He uses a very familiar and offensive word for God. He uses the word Daddy. I say offensive because for the religious people, it was blasphemy. How dare you? How dare you degrade God like that? He's more than daddy. That's why Jesus said, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. So he sets these two things juxtaposed once again against one another. We have this God who is all-powerful, omniscient, holy. And then he says, when you address him, say this. Hi, dad. My friends, when you get that, it's powerful. So when you pray, pray to God, our Father. Because our prayer life is affected by how we view him. Jesus knew that. The one who sits, picture this, the one who sits on the throne the book of Revelation says that his voice is like the sound of many waters. It's, his throne is, he is in this light that you can't penetrate, blinding light. And his throne is surrounded by thunder and lightning. And all the angels surrounding his throne say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And they say it day and night. And the living creatures cover their face with their wings, and they all proclaim, and the, the, the kings and the elders, they throw down their crowns before him. And we come in. We say, Hi, Dad. It's me. It's me, John Mark. Woo! Man, that's powerful. That's what Jesus said when you pray. Pray, Abba is the word. I would, I would encourage you. You want to grow closer to God. Go on a daddy date. Say, hey, dad. It's me.
you curl up. Remember curling up? Did you, ever, did you have that kind of relationship with your dad? Did you, did you get to curl up on his lap? Did he swing you around? I don't know what kind of relationship that you had with your dad, but I can tell you what kind of one that you can have with God. And it's, it's that kind that you always wanted with your dad or the kind that you miss because he's not around anymore. I'll tell you, your father is here and he loves you. We're heading home here. <laughs> Jesus, this, this thing rocked the disciples, I mean. <clears throat> they couldn't stop talking about the fact that they had been adopted as sons. They kept writing about it. It blew Paul away. John, the Apostle John, in 1 John 3, 1 said, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. In Galatians 4, verse 4, through seven says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You say that with me? Abba, Father. One more time. Abba, Father. It says that that spirit within us cries out for that. Did you know that your spirit cries out to Abba Father, even when your mouth doesn't? It longs for relationship with Abba Father. And I'll tell you, it's a good thing to meet that need for yourself. So when you pray, pray to God, our Father. Finally, pray to God, our Father, for others. I say this because this, and did you catch the the, the, the theme throughout this prayer, the very first word was what? Our Father. Now, he's my Father, and I love the fact that he's mine, but he is more than my Father, isn't he? He's our Father. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive others. So the context of this prayer is set in relationship. And just like all of the spiritual realm, everything is about relationship to God and relationship to others. And so Jesus says, listen, your relationship to others will affect your relationship to God. And if there's stuff in between you and others, get it right. Or it's going to affect your relationship with my father. He was so practical, wasn't he? This teaching was so practical. He said, if you want to, to, to impact your prayer life, get along with God and meet with him. But I'm also reminding you that he is also, he belongs to everybody. It's a big family. And I have lots of brothers and sisters. And you need to be right with them and be right with God. Or your prayer life will be hindered. Are you with me so far? Our Father. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into, tempta not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This whole prayer must go beyond me. I've got to pray for you. And you've got to pray for me. And we've got to pray for the church. And we've got to pray for the church at large. We've got to pray for the persecuted church. And we've got to pray for those who don't no, God. And we've got to pray that they will join us in this family. Right? As I close, you know, in, in, Mark, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14, it says again, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive yours. I mean, that's a scary passage, isn't it? I don't like to preach that very much because it's scary theologically if you get right down to it. It's super scary. I don't like that verse. I don't. But there it is, staring me right in the face, reminding me that my relationship with my father is to some degree affected and dependent on how I relate to you. 
and the people that annoy me and people that offend me, people that hurt my feelings, and people that take away my rights, things I feel that should happen or shouldn't happen. And just rem rem as a reminder, you want to grow close to God. Allow yourself to forgive others. This is where also my desire to bring honor to God. Remember earlier I said, hallowed be your name. It's just this desire to honor God. And that's where this comes home on this last line about the fact that I, I need to forgive others. Why do I do that? I don't do it just for me, although it is freeing to forgive others. But I do it because I want to bring honor to God. And in Matthew chapter 5, so just a few verses before this, this passage on prayer, Jesus says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Martin Luther was asked, how is God's name hallowed among us? And his answer was, when both our doctrines and our living are truly Christian. How is God's name hallowed? It's, it's, when, it's when I live what I believe. It's what Jesus said. Don't be like the hypocrites. Don't act. You know, if you're struggling, it's okay to admit that you're struggling. You know, we're not talking about being perfect here. And there is no condemnation here. As a matter of fact, I want to close with an encouragement. If you consider this our Father, who is on the other end of that prayer? He is one who is hungry to meet with you and I. Scripture says that his eyes are constantly roaming the earth, seeking for people who will seek him. And is he reluctant to hear our prayers or to answer our prayers? Not at all. As a matter of fact, he's eager for us to pray. He can't wait for us to join together with other believers because he's our father. And when we link arms together and we say, he's our father, and we come together in prayer, and we lift up the, the needs of the hurting and the sick, and we pray for people and believe for healing, and when we link arms to touch the hurting and the sick, you know that we aren't doing it alone because he's our Father. And as we pray, he's on the other side of that going, yes, 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 yes. I love to hear you pray it that way, son. Great job, daughter. As a matter of fact, boom, angels, get on that right now. Let's get this taken care of. Let's, let's get this disease healed. Let's, let's get this financial need met. Let's, let's see this lost one come to faith in Jesus Christ. I love that he is here. Can you bow your head and close your eyes with me today? I said our father because he is. But this is not a default setting to all of humanity. Scripture says that we are, although we are all his creation, he doesn't force this relationship on any of us. As a matter of fact, he says that we have received this spirit only by those who cry out to him and call on him and ask him to become their dad. And so I want to take a moment just to do that, to have this moment for you right now. Because if you call, he'll answer. If you pray like the prayer of the tax collector and you pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner, he'll meet your need right now, right here, wherever you are. Here in this room, you're listening online, you're live streaming, you're, you're podcasting this. Right here where you are, your room becomes a holy place. It becomes a life-changing place where you meet with God. And he comes, the God of the universe, kneels down and scoops you up in his arms says it's okay I love you and in that moment as you surrender and you lay yourself down he lifts you up it's just a simple prayer I mean it's no magic words but it's it's something as simple as father forgive me I don't want to be separated from you I'm sorry for living life for me and forgetting about you and I want to live my life for you. And I want to live my life with you. I want you to walk with me and talk with me. And I want to learn how to live right and how to please you. So, Father, would you apply 
all of the mercy that's available to me in Jesus Christ, would you wash away my past? Would you hit the delete button on my past? And would you make me right with you and let my future be as bright as you are? In Jesus' name.